Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Strengthening Livestock Systems Through Climate Smart and Gender Sensitive Approaches. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. Please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Indicate who your question is for and feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar and our Q&A session will be at the end of the event. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are posted. Thank you so much for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Emma Ratten. Thanks, Michael. So uh, my name is Emma Bratton. I am a Livestock Veterinarian and American Association for the Advancement of Science, Science and Technology Policy Fellow at USAID. I sit in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security in the Center for Agriculture-Led Growth, and I help manage the Livestock Systems Innovation Lab. I also have a coordinating role in the Agricultural Threats Working Group and One Health Working Group and I sit on the Bureau's Gender Tiger Team. This webinar is part of Livestock Month on AgriLinks. Specifically, our theme for this month is livestock as a key solution for the climate crisis and women's empowerment. To support this theme, we wanted to highlight Feed the Future efforts to strengthen animal feed, fodder, and forage production and feeding approaches as a major solution for the climate crisis and women's empowerment. This includes highlighting how increasing livestock production can achieve the co-benefits of increased resilience, sustainable economic growth, and nutrition security for vulnerable populations, especially women. That said, we also want to acknowledge that livestock production leads to externalities that we will work to mitigate in order to optimize the benefits of livestock to people in low and middle income countries. During uh, the rest of this month, we are also soliciting an open call for questions on AgriLinks related to this panel and livestock and international development generally. Um, and I will post the link for that Google form in the chat so that you can um, uh, post your questions um, if you would like. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. So um, to signpost this panel, we will start with a presentation by Dr. Ermias Kabrab from UC Davis discussing, discussing livestock contributions to greenhouse gas emissions and specifically methane and how ration formulation and feed additives for cattle can help decrease methane emissions. We will follow that with a presentation by Judy Odongo discussing the Feed the Future Kenya Crops and Dairy Market Systems Activities success in achieving the co-benefits of reducing methane emissions while increasing production for dairy cattle via improved nutrition. This in turn led to increased income generation and availability of nutritious animal source foods for women and youth in the region. Next, Nelson Owanji will then discuss how using the GIRL, which stands for Girls Improving Resilience Through Livelihoods model, has used livestock production as a way to build capacities and improve livelihoods in the face of drought in northern Kenya. Finally, Nurul Siddiqui from the Bangladesh Mission will discuss how their Feed the Future livestock and nutrition activity helps to increase the empowerment of women involved throughout the livestock value chain. He will also discuss how livestock act as a source of resilience from climate shocks and reiterate how improved diet formulations help conserve land and decrease emissions intensity for livestock. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Kabrab. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to talk about um, mainly livestock methane emissions and what opportunities we have to reduce those uh, emissions. Next slide, please. 
So uh, if we look at it globally, what is the contribution of, of different sectors around the, the, the world? Um, and the energy sector is about 75% uh, or three quarters of the emissions uh, coming uh, around the world is from the energy sector. And from uh, agriculture is the, the, the second largest, which is about 18% um, or so. So this is basically um, the whole of agriculture. And if you look at, if you break it down uh, from different sectors of agriculture, we see that uh, livestock and manure uh, about almost 6%, and then we have agricultural soils, rice, uh, cultivation, uh, crop burning, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if, if, if you then uh, look at the, the, the methane breakdown from livestock, uh, from each of the d different animals uh, or, or livestock species, we see that in beef systems, most of it is from the front end or, or it is the enteric emissions uh, that makes up the, the most of the, the, the emissions, while in a dairy, it's about 50-50, uh, mainly because a lot of dairy systems, they use um, uh, things like lagoons to collect the, the manure, and, and therefore the manure will have a contribution to methane emissions as well, while in pork, again, it's mostly the manure as uh, they are non-ruminants and, and they don't have the ability, they don't have the uh, methanogens within their gut to, to, to convert it into, uh, into methane. Next, please. <clears throat> Uh, so we have a lot of different types of uh, mitigation strategies, and this could um, range from uh, looking into the adult animal itself, so direct inhibition of methanogenesis using things like um, um, anti-methanogen inhibitors or even vaccines, or it could be an indirect method uh, of, through the, uh, the adult animal, and that could be changing the, the chemical composition of the diet, uh, increasing the amount of lipids in the, in the diet, and uh, providing alternative metabolic pathways so that you can take away hydrogen from the methanogens into a, a different route, and, and then using some sort of um, antimicrobials as well. Uh, there are also been efforts to, to do some defaunation or to basically modulate the, the rumen microbiome, and um, lately there's uh, uh, an increased interest in breeding um, animals that are low methane emitting animals. This has been quite successful in the case of sheep, but uh, um, there's more work that's been done in, in cattle uh, because of the, uh, the time it takes for cattle is longer. Uh, we'll see this is a long-term strategy, but this is part of the whole strategy to, to reduce uh, methane emissions from uh, ruminants. Next slide, please. And when we when we see that you know by changing those uh, the diets, uh, looking into the nutrition and genetics and all that, there has been quite a big reduction in emissions already. Uh, this is a, an analysis that was done to compare the emissions uh, in in California in dairy cattle uh, from the 1960s to to, to the 2000s. And what you see here is that on on the red bar is the the 1960s, and then the, the blue and, and and the gray bars are on the 2014 uh, using different assumptions. And in both cases, you, you see that there was a quite a drastic reduction in emissions associated with dairy production. In terms of the feed production, there's quite a big reduction, and that's because uh, we, we now have better genetics for, for crops. We have better yield, so we don't use as much uh, inputs into the, into the system to get the same yield. Uh, farm management has reduced, and a big reduction in enteric methane emissions, and that's because we have increased the, the productivity of those animals. So per kilogram of milk that we are producing, we have really re reduced the, those emissions. So by this estimate, almost 50% reduction uh, in enteric methane emissions because of the improvements that, that we've done in um, uh, particularly in, in increasing the, uh, the milk production through genetics as well as through uh, nutrition and uh, management. Next, please. And this is uh, now we're trying to translate this in a number of countries around the world, and that is done through um, putting together a Russian formation software that, that is available in in the language of where you want to use it, and also for different species. For example, here you see um, you can formulate diets for uh, countries like Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Cambodia, Laos, Nigeria, and, and Vietnam, and they have uh, associated. Um, diets and, and ingredients 
that are based from those countries um, that, that they are being used. So it's very much targeted uh, and uh, and all people who have to do that is choose your country, choose your language, choose the animal you want to formulate for, and then you get the diet formulation. And one of the things that has helped in in uh, all over the world, uh, particularly in, in Europe and, and US has been the use of this nutrition models, this uh, software to, to uh, formulate rations. And we, uh, so the USAID is trying to do the same thing and uh, provide uh, tools for people to be able to use it. And these tools are being converted into mobile apps so that um, the access to those tools would be uh, a lot easier as the smartphone use among farmers, among uh, extension agents is increasing, um, then the uptake of this will, will increase as well. Next, please. And the other way of reducing methane emissions, directly reducing methane emissions is using feed additives. There has been a number of feed additives that has been uh, looked at, researched, and this, this continues now this is a very active area of research. And um, this is basically using a very small amount of uh, feed additive to reduce the, um, uh, the amount of methane that's been emitted. So for example, um, there's a number of uh, experiments that was done using seaweed, it's a specific type of seaweed that has shown to reduce emissions by up to 80%. Uh, there are others uh, called free NOP or bovire or secondary plant compounds that are available in tropical countries, uh, oregano and uh, tannins and uh, lemongrass, for example, contains um, a, a lot of uh, tannins um, uh, using nitrate and using other feed additives have been shown to reduce quite emissions quite a bit as well. So this is a way to for 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 farmers to be able to to reduce their emissions. Next slide, please. So in in, in conclusion, the livestock industry has already made quite a big uh, progress in sustainability when we compare it over uh, in the last fifty years. But we need to do this all over the world. So this has happened in the U.S. and, and, and uh, in Europe, but we need to make this uh, happening all over the world. And um, we can use this. Uh, we can do it in, in a couple of ways. One is the improving feed efficiency um, using ration formation software, improving the forage availability and the, the type of forage that's been grown as well, or using feed additives as well, or a combination of both of those uh, methods will, uh, will help us achieve that as well. So next slide, please. And thank you for your attention and happy to answer questions. Thanks, Armaias. Um, so uh, Judy Odongo is going to speak next. So good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone. So. I'm going to take uh, what uh, the first presenter has done and taking it, narrowing it down to uh, a case of the Kenya Crops and Dairy Market Systems Activity, uh, where we have been doing a lot of work in dairy, um, and, and part of it is actually improving uh, cattle nutrition and how that has contributed to methane emissions and women economic empowerment. Next slide, please. That is just um, an overview of where the Kenya Crops and Dairy um, activity has focused in Kenya. We are focused on the in, in 12 counties, as you can see. And um, just uh, for all of us to know, these are the places where dairy was quite pre-commercialized. So we are, we're really building uh, the market systems from, from, from nascent. Next slide, please. So this is a young woman. We love her so much. Um, she worked, uh, they, they, they finished college together with her brother. They didn't get employment, so went back to the village, asked for space. They started doing yogurt uh, processing, collecting milk from like 20 farmers. Um, we met them at that point where they were just struggling. So all this equipment and, and the branding and what you see here is actually through the partnership with the USA Kenya Crops and Dairy. And today, her and her brother are, are, are now employed by their business. They've also employed 11 people. They work with over 100 farmers. And those 100 farmers have also benefited from interventions towards the uh, Increase nutrition, improve nutrition, so are contributing to the results I'm going to share in a bit. Next slide, please. 
So when we started uh, our work in the dairy space, though many challenges with the farmer starting from production all the way to the markets, uh, biggest is limited um, quality, limited access to quality feed and fodder, as well as just being able to use it properly. But the hard sizes are small. In fact, at any one time, um, from from our from our surveys, a farmer has just wanted to, you know, lactating cows. The production was very low. They are not aggregating. So all these um, challenges that we have uh, with the farmer, the the cows are also, you know, low grade. So we've done. A lot of things as going to present in the next slide. Next slide, please. So we 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 because of those many uh, challenges, we coined interventions for the dairy sector and working together with the International uh, Livestock Research Institute and other you know stakeholders in the dairy space. Uh, interventions around market linkages, improved breeding and animal health, extension and advisory services and quality fodder and fodder production and commercialization. We also did some work in industry standards on feed and animal nutrition and a lot of work in input supply, um, especially supplements. Other interventions at higher level have included working with the Ministry of, of, of Livestock um, to develop and disseminate, um, Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock to develop and disseminate um, harmonized dairy cattle uh, nutrition extension material. Again, this informed by a study I'm just going to talk about. Um, and we are also currently doing something with the uh, East Africa Grain Council and the East Africa community on developing standard animal animal nutrition standards that would actually set, you know, pace for 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 implementation of better nutrition standards across the region. Next slide, please. Um, so our work in dairy, as I have just shown, um, has seen us work with uh, 58 private sector partners, including that young girl we saw up there, 42 of, 42 of them, um, women co-own them. We have seen 1,200 um, jobs created, um, again, in that sector, 34% um, women uh, jobs to women we have worked with 191 uh, farming households 191,056% women um we have seen um sales of both milk and milk products and uh, feed and fodder because we worked in feed and fodder also as a market system to just develop the fodder uh, market system and we are seeing close to 150 million in, in, in sales. Again, we can, you can see the percentages that are going to women um, and, and girls. And I just put this one thing here, which is very dear to the women. There's been increased consumption of milk at, at, at the household level. Um, I'll, I'll leave the overview of the work we've done in KCDMS and people can follow later. So next slide, please. So we um, carried out a study in uh, 2019 was the baseline, and we did the end line sometime mid last year. And this study was around, you know, helping us to understand um, if they, if improving dairy nutrition would actually in, uh, increase milk productivity, but also contribute to methane emissions. Um, and so, first of all, just, you know, building up on what um, the other presenter has, has done. Methane emissions from, the, from dairy cattle, we have 15% of the global um, um, greenhouse gas emissions from livestock, 20% of, uh, of, of, of livestock greenhouse gas emissions is from dairy, and 80% of, 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 um, of dairy greenhouse gases from developing countries. So that is just like the global picture. Next slide, please. So after conducting these studies, um, best line in 2019, uh, end line in 2022, mid, um, with the same farmers uh, in the same uh, geographies, uh, the findings, this is just part of the findings, really highlights. Uh, is that milk productivity increased by 43 percent 
uh, this is so much contributed to by increased nutrition uh, of, of dairy cattle and 60% increase in sales for the farmers, which is, which, is a, which is a big thing. And then we saw methane intensity decrease at 27% for each liter uh, of milk produced. And this is a huge thing and there's potential to even double that uh, if, if practices are just, you know, intensified. Um, that 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 um, turns into like 43% from from um, extrapolation, 43,000 uh, cows um, that are under good practice of um, dairy practices that is contributing to methane emissions, and and you can see the figures. So a big a big um, leap there in in contributing to decreased methane. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the implications here? The implications are that agricultural productivity gains can mitigate methane emissions while also increasing food security. That is one of the big things we just, we just you know, were able to contribute to. And then scaling um, adoption of improved practices is key to methane emissions. Again, this is really aligning to the first presenter. and of course, in, investing in, in, in dairy and, and, and improved um, nutrition for cows is also contributing to women economic empowerment as, as we have demonstrated. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much for listening to me. Happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Nelson Owanji will speak next. Nelson, are you here with us? Sorry about that, everyone. I think we'll hop on over to Neural and uh, we will return back to Nelson when he rejoins. So we will skip ahead to Neural slides. Just a moment, Neural. Thank you. We are preparing your slides. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks, everyone. Um, welcome to this presentation to this webinar. My name is uh, Nurul Siddiqui, and I'm an ACD of Voca Chief of Party. Um, we are implementing uh, the five-year uh, Feed the Future Bangladesh Livestock and Nutrition Activity aims to sustainably increase livestock productivity, uh, marketability uh, of livestock products, and um, household consumption of safe and diversified uh, livestock products in um, 23 southern districts of Bangladesh. We focus on access to finance, uh, adoption of ICT tools, and uh, gender and youth inclusion issues. Uh, our activity targets um, 1 million cattle and goat owning households across the uh, life of the activity. Um, before we jump into some of the specific sort of approaches we um, we use in terms of the livestock production, uh, gender and climate change, I would like to start uh, with a quick poll. Um, let's see, what do you think? Um, why do Bangladeshi farmers um, rear livestock? Um, is that for land cultivation, family consumption, income, to cope with natural disasters, or to give us wedding presents and gifts?
please post. Okay, moving to the results. Yeah, thank you very much um, for your participation. I see that, you know, a um, lot of votes has come for income, which is um, very true. Uh, family consumption as well. And uh, it's interesting that many of you has also highlighted as wedding gifts and presents. It does happen that the rural Bangladeshi households, you know, during um, the marriage of their uh, daughter, uh, cows and goats actually does go as wedding gifts um, and as an asset for for that. Um, so um, yeah, um, the the important point that I wanted to highlight is that. Um, you know, um, Bangladeshis does use uh, the, you know, livestock assets to cope with natural um, disasters as well. Um, to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, I echo with all my fellow presenters that we need to take more actions to reduce the environmental impact of livestock activities. Um, and but I, I also, you know, I'm, I'm strong believer of the phrase that, you know, livestock um, is also needs to be part of the solution, um, especially when, um, you know, millions of people's livelihood and, and, and nutrition is dependent on livestock, which is the which is the case for Bangladesh. Um, household leaves near coasts and river and islands represents the most vulnerable. Uh, yet the most significant owners of large and small women. And cattle and goats are considered as one of the most significant um, assets, not just during emergencies, but um, uh, also, um, you know, it is evident that how income from, from livestock directly impact education and well-being of these vulnerable families. Uh, and livestock also play a very important role in nutrition, where uh, malnutrition in Bangladesh is heavily linked with dietary patterns. Um, and uh, more than half of the children, as adolescents and women, consume diets, um, uh, you know, um, oftentimes which are not adequately diversified. So um, animal source food have an irreplaceable uh, uh, role in diversifying the diet for getting optimal nutrition. In the next few slides, um, we would like to share, um, you know, our activity approaches to sustainably intensify uh, livestock production and marketing, um, as well as driving consumption uh, alongside livelihoods. Next slide, please. So for uh, this project, um, one of the most significant uh, efforts we, we did in the first 16 months is to um, um, address a challenge uh, which is very, um, you know, common to Bangladesh because it's a small country, it's one fifth size of Kenya. Um, but it's um, it's to um, also, um, you know, therefore uh, land are very scarce and Bangladesh is, um, you know, I think they're very well known for not leaving an inch of land unproductive. But um, uh, I think the main challenge was to um, look into um, ways how um, um, technologies such as highly uh, productive and highly producing um, uh, resistant varieties like, um, you know, um, cuttings and seeds of high producing saline food and flood and, and drought resilient forage varieties can be disseminated widely. And um, we have worked closely with Bangladesh Livestock Research Institute utilize their research stations 
and dairy companies uh, to disseminate them in scale to foreign entrepreneurs and farmers. And this is very important for the adaptation of the region. Um, and what we have seen like 22% uh, of over nearly 500 fodder entrepreneurs who receive this capacity building um, services um, um, from the project are women. And a quarter of these entrepreneurs are also youth. We are able to demonstrate the year-round productivity solution to farmers. And uh, um, the result was that both the entrepreneurs and farmers have shown high willingness to pay for these forage varieties. 37% um, of all the livestock service providers who received capacity building support from the activity partners uh, are youth and uh, receive training on low emission interventions such as ration formulation, formulation based on farm byproducts. Um, combination of quality forage and also uh, local solutions to improve farm production. Um, so during the um, first year, we are also able to roll out a number of co-investment projects uh, with private sectors to improve the productivity and marketability aspects of, of milk and, and meat production. And um, the, the gender, youth, and social inclusion approaches therefore help to, um, you know, build capacity for these um, enthusiastic entrepreneurs on CSA practices. Um, and it actually went beyond, um, you know, women's and youth role as farmers and just, um, you know, their role as farmers. But also, um, we have seen, um, you know, how improductive and decision making could be impacted as a result of these approaches. Next slide, please. So the activity, um, gender and inclusion strategies to empower women and youth to, and, 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 you know, engage them into higher value livestock sector work. Um, uh, reducing societal barriers to become livestock service providers and helping market system actors see the benefit of investing into them. Our partnership with private sector um, animal breeding service providers in year one has increased the opportunity for women and youth to become successful insemination workers, which were not very common. Um, however, initial results shown that increased number of services provided by them um, already uh, to farmers, but then private partners also shared their excitement around the insemination success rate um, achieved by this network of inseminators. In particular, for, for native breeds, which are more resilient to local climate, such as the red Chittagong cattle and black Bengal goats, um, and these um, uh, breeds also require least resources to manage, and they're they're um, less prone to disease as well. And by all means, they're more um, um, climatically adaptive to the to the local situation. Next slide, please. So um, some of the takeaways, and it was um, really encouraging to see some of the results um, that from the higher farm income and uptake of CSA practices reported. Um, um, when women um, decision, women were the prime decision maker on particular farm expenditures. Uh, the activity annual survey um, over 1,200 farm respondents showed the uptake of improved technology and man management practices, such as establishment of vaccination and deworming services, feeding supplement with concentrates, improved forage feeding, such as silage, um, farm manure management, and higher uptake rates for these climate-friendly farm practices were observed when farm expenditure decisions were made by women member as opposed to the men members of the household. Um, the activity partner biodigester companies has also shared their enthusiasm with increased biodigester unit sales, saying that the ever-increasing cost of energies um, many households does realize the potential of biogas generated from a three cattle owned farm and, and can significantly increase the income and well-being potential of the 
of the rural households. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you for your patience hearing, and uh, we look forward to um, you know to the to the next sessions. Over to you, Emma. Thanks, Neural. I think that Nelson has rejoined, so if you can, uh, we can go back to his slides. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nelson Owange, and um, I will be talking about how the GAL model has used livestock production as a way to build capacities and improve livelihoods in the face of drought in northern Kenya. And so this is uh, one of the activities which is USAID for the Future Funded implemented in the northern part of the country bordering, of course, Uganda, Ethiopia, and, and Somalia. And so GAL is... Um, uh, next slide, please. So GAL is an acronym uh, which means Girls Improving Resilience uh, Through Livelihoods. And uh, uh, this model is an improved version of uh, an initial model which was actually Girls Improving Resilience Through Livestock. And at that moment, the thinking was specifically concentrated on livestock as an option for livelihoods for adolescent uh, girls. And uh, this is uh, more than a more. Uh, this is more of a safe space model, which is targeting adolescent girls, uh, particularly aged 10 to 19 years of age, and young women, of course, 19 to 24 years of age. The model um, enables the girls to go through at least nine months of psychosocial support, helping them to identify their aspirations as well as the journey, their journey to. Uh, where they want to be. It identifies the different shocks and stresses and then helps them on how to help them build their capacities to those shocks and stresses. And this is an environment in which patriarchal system is still very key. And, at, uh, and in this system, at, uh, whereas there are adolescent girls, majority of whom have actually been, um, been married. And so they are also young uh, mothers. And, and so what is important to note is that particularly when adolescent girls identify their aspirations, it's mainly going back to school, either primary, secondary or tertiary, or a, a vocational training and or starting a business, uh, you know, to tr as a transition pathway. But when you push this aspiration further, and when girls begin to earn income, then livestock comes out as their bank account, their ATM, and their risk diversification matrix. Uh, and, and all businesses which are diversified come up to, uh, apart from uh, a lot of them in the livestock value chain, but also in concentrating their assets in livestock. So with the drought and uh, particularly the impacts of climate change, we can move into the next slide. Uh, with drought and particularly the impacts of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, climate change, one of the things which is very important uh, is particularly to continue livestock production and, and consumption, even in the face of that drought. And, and the availability of water, particularly, and pasture is key for that continuum, you know, to take place. And so that required us to work with the other community level structures. And those community level structures were able to support, um, you know, communities, particularly to, uh, to, to have water sources, particularly the water pans. Uh, and, and, and those water pans, one of the key important things is the girls use those water sources to be able to grow pasture and, uh, and particularly uh, forages and, and also some crops and the crop vines as well as those pastures became very important sources of feed for, for, for livestock. 
uh, particularly the, the goats in this case. It was also very clear that the groups who had fought us and, 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 and you know, are also the groups in which you find their children were able to access those milk and you would see a more healthier children in those groups which actually uh, had uh, fodder produced in, um, in, the, in the various water sources which were there. So we, we noted the importance of uh, sustaining the water availability. And in order to sustain that, we worked closely with the private sector partners in Northern Kenya. One of the private sector partners we, you know, we had held from the urban city center in Nairobi to go and be able to see the opportunities that exist in the northern part of the country. And when they see, you know, you know, uh, groups which are willing to post share establishment of water infrastructures, mainly solar irrigated water infrastructures, piping, pumping them into farms and helping produce not only crops, but also pastures for livestock, then they were able to use that opportunity you know, also with some buying in from the county government uh, and to be able to establish those irrigation systems, which actually enabled uh, girls to, to have those fodder and grass. And so even the girls who diversified into livestock production as a livelihood opportunity were able actually to use Nelson, Sorry, everybody. Just... It appears that we lost Nelson momentarily. I think he's having a network issue. Nelson, if you can hear us, please maybe try and leave and rejoin. Thank you so much. Please pardon this brief interruption. We will be back shortly. In the meantime, I want to do a quick plug. I see we're getting a lot of questions in the chat, and I also just wanted to say that you can continue to ask questions after the event on agrilinks.org. We've got an open call for questions running, and I've just posted that in the event chat. <clears throat> so we are just waiting for our speaker to rejoin, and as soon as he's back, we'll continue with this presentation. And then just after that, we will be doing a Q&A session based on all of the questions that you have been asking throughout the event. Thank you once again for joining us today. We're just gonna give Nelson another minute. Sorry, everybody. Uh, just a quick reminder, this is not a, uh, a sort of lost audio issue. We <clears throat> have just lost connection with Nelson. I think it's just a, a simple network issue, and we are working to resolve it, and he should be back online momentarily. Um, but if we don't hear from him in another minute or so, then we'll just move straight over onto the Q&A. Thank you once again for joining us. And uh, another quick plug, head over to agrolinks.org and check out all of the wonderful blogs that have been posted for our Livestock Month. We've gotten a lot of really excellent blog submissions. We're very proud of the collection that has been growing over there. Thank you so much, and we appreciate your patience.
Hi everyone, um, thanks for bearing with us through these technical difficulties. Um, we are going to go ahead and move to the Q&A and hopefully uh, Nelson can rejoin um, and help answer some of those questions. Um, so there are um, some pre-written questions um, for all panelists to answer. So the first of which is, in light of the newly launched U.S. government strategy on global women's economic security, how do you see women's economic empowerment supporting the success of climate-smart livestock production in low- and middle-income countries moving forward? directed to anyone? Emma? So yes, any of the panelists can go ahead and answer this question. So Judy Odongo here, um, just as we have demonstrated in, 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 um, in the work that we have done in dairy, uh, there's huge potential for women participation uh both from production uh all the way to um to the to the markets and they they they're involved in various areas in the chain and even where you think women are not doing artificial insemination now we have quite a number actually participating um in service provision in that area in extension um and so i think that if we just targeted you know the nodes very well and just you know help the women especially be able to much more access the assets that is where the challenge is um i think we are we are headed for a very vibrant say, dairy sector where women are, are participating as well as the men are even the youth actually girls and and, and youth boys um as much so the biggest challenge is asset. Um, they just like have challenges to access the finances, you know, uh, their challenges are more than the challenges for men would be. Hey, Emma, um, Siddiqui here. Um... In 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 relation to the to the strategy, I think uh, the the um, the priority line of E43, which is about promoting entrepreneurship and financial and digital inclusion um, through investment of the new strategy, is very relevant um, in our context, where um, you know livestock farmers were you know dominated by let's say women as key managers of those farms and entrepreneurs also need access to markets right i think and and finance um and i think they were evident through all three presentations um we started with like digital innovations right and and which are key to um you know capacity building on climate smart livestock practices um the the feeding app that you know kebab was talking at the very beginning but however, access to climate smart training and resources is not enough. So uh, we also need um, voice um, or agency, women's agency to be able to implement these livestock practices in their farms and also the, the small businesses in their, in their business um, parameters. Um, so I think this, this is very, very relevant. Great, thank you for those contributions. Um, so the next question is, as we work to combat the wicked problem of climate change, what do you see as the importance of partnering with diverse local and US-based actors to ensure the continued health of humans, animals, and ecosystems? If I can start with that. Um, uh, well, well, I think the, the, 
the, the, the ability to, to, to learn from, from each other, you know, uh, there's a lot of development that's happening uh, all over the world and um, it, it really applies in, in different situations, right? So there's no one, one solution to, uh, to, to reduce the, uh, the impact of uh, livestock on climate change. There are different ways of, of doing that. And so working together would help in, in, in getting this thing uh, moving forward. Uh, I, I give the example of the Russian formation software, for example, you know, we, uh, we've learned a lot uh, using that. Um, so no farmer in the US or Europe would dream of uh, feeding their, their animals without first formulating the, those diets, right? And so that, that's what, that's uh, translating that and making sure that it is uh, context appropriate. We're using the right ingredients from that country, from that, not just the country, but from the region as well. Um, and also not just from that region, but also the, the, the seasons that the, those ingredients are available and also including byproducts and all that. So by putting all this together and learning from each other, I think that would help us in, in improving their productivity and at the same time, reducing the intensity of emissions as well. So Emma, um, the context that I would respond to this question is just that the consultants that um, undertook the study, um, the, uh, the our dairy methane study, are actually um, dairy farmers themselves in America, um, really extensive um, dairy farmers, and um, they they share a lot of a lot of insights, um, even as they interacted with us, they they interacted with farmers in the cooperatives a lot. And so they'll just be sharing, you know, a lot of things that could really just small, small things that could change, you know, the landscape and change the way that um, farmers, you know, are practicing their animal nutrition and the benefits that they, that they gain from it. And of course, the bigger benefit, which is towards, um, methane emission and they were able to share a lot of you know good information and so just that cross you know cross learning it was small but it it yielded a lot that we are replaying to the farmers that has contributed to us working with the ministry uh, of agriculture towards development of the you know harmonized cattle you know training um cattle nutrition training material and we hope that then we can have over time harmonized information that is going, extension information that is going to the farmers. A lot of this is informed, of course, from the study and a lot of it also like from what the experience uh, was. The farm is called. Go ahead, Judy. Oh, sorry. I've been talking all this while and I was muted. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was saying, um, that the two farms that, um, the farm that did our best line and end line is a farm called, uh, Rumeth International. And it's for, um, it's run by two, um, gentlemen who are also farmers in America, dairy farmers in America. They're really extensive. And so besides just undertaking the study, they, you know, shared a lot of, a lot of learning and a lot of what has worked for them. Um, and what can, you know, the farmers can do and change a little bit here and there. And those practices that could hugely contribute both to, to, to improve productivity, but also to increase methane emissions. Just things like even playing with the with the with the with the supplements, um, increasing calcium and and things like those in the supplements that could make a huge change. So just the, there's a lot of value in in cross learning, and as as the other speaker said, you you it, it, it's not fixated, but it's when when it happens and when you have to when you get to interact, maybe platforms for you know, farmers to just, or people to just learn from each other would really, you know, create positive uh, impact. Thank you. Emma, I, I wanted to share um, one of our um, 
you know, partnerships with the uh, animal health company here in Bangladesh, where um, the One Health approach, um, you know, has been uh, a center of, um, uh, I think, uh, tension um, to look at issues such as the antimicrobial resistance and um, what are some of the, you know, actions that um, large companies can bring in terms of, you know, some of the behavior changes and how can they, um, you know, um, use their convening power to establish many of those best practices in the system. Um, and where, you know, all the human animal health as well as the ecosystem interact. So, um, you know, some of the initial sort of results that we have seen as a result of the diverse, you know, partnership is, is that, um, you know, uh, even though there are initial uh, fears of losing businesses, uh, companies are also able to uh, start new, new line of businesses. Um, products, those are, um, you know, um, critical to um, improve uh, gut health. Um, also, you know, some of the uh, key interactions between how um, antibiotics are prescribed and um, how these behaviors um, gradually then uh, affect the other behaviors um, at the farm level. So um, I think it's it's really key to um, reach out and um, to diverse set of partners. And also I think uh, linking to the first presentation Many of the technologies um, does really needs to uh, be more available and, um, you know, um, applicable to the context we have in the developing countries. I'm sure like many of the industry um, owners are also looking for those solutions. And, you know, therefore, one of our key goals is to also demonstrate um, the value of these new technologies to the um, to the market actors when it comes to um, you know the um, the overall um, um, issues about human health and animal health. Great, thanks everyone. So we are going to move now to audience submitted questions. Uh, the first question is for Hermes. Um, this is actually a group of questions that are related. Um, so uh, talking about what types of nutritionally improved fodder seeds or fodder crops specifically can reduce um, methane emission for cattle? Yeah, so um, the, 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 there is a direct correlation between the amount of fiber in a forage and the methane emissions. So. The, the lower the the, the fiber uh, in, in the forages, so you will have lower methane emissions as well. But uh, obviously, we have to make sure that there is enough fiber in the diet. Uh, otherwise, there will be other issues that will be coming up as well. So yeah, I think the the, the first thing is uh, more digestible fiber, uh, a better digestible fiber, the digestible uh, NDF or the neutral detergent fiber in the in the diet will improve the the, the emissions. At the same time. Higher amounts of lipids would also improve. Uh, lipids do, do not get uh, degraded in the rumen, so they don't contribute to methane emissions, but they contribute to the energy uh, availability of the animal. So, uh, higher uh, amount of lipids with uh, lower um, fiber or, or better, better digestible feed with higher lipids would, would be the ones that would reduce methane emission and also improve productivity at the same time. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks to those who submitted that question. Um, so the next question is for Judy. Um, Faith Awar, sorry if I mispronounced, asked, um, what are some of the improved dairy management practices that you promoted that have the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and Kawa Dodd um, asked a similar question. Um, okay, so one just um, simple one was the again as I said uh, the 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 previous speaker is promotion of of you know 
uh, planting and farmers using, you know, uh, high, uh, better quality grasses um, like bracaria for, for, you know, feeding their animals. Um, and then just discouraging farmers, for example, from using, you know, things like maize stovers, um, just like the, it's debatable. But yeah, uh, from 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 the advice again we got from the from the you know the experts, they said yeah, it doesn't help so much, especially except maybe it is used in silage or something like that. Um, and just you know the right feeding regimes, um, and you know those are those are just part of the of the things. The bigger the bigger part uh, was was actually the grasses quality grasses and so there's a lot of growing of quality grasses and use of quality grasses and the other one was use of supplements um, and encouraging uh, farmers to use calcium and use high energy um, you know supplements also uh, in addition to 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 the grasses so those two are, are the bigger ones of course there are many others and my colleague Seth um, is also posting stuff on the wall Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is for Neural. Uh, Brian Foster and Mood Bashra both asked about manure biodigesters and if these would be economically feasible for a small farmer or groups of farmers um, when the value of the manure is readily utilized by land application for crop production. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. And I think um, in in our context, um, um, the adoption of biodigesters were um, um, I think were seen in areas where um, you know areas dominated by aquaculture, for example. And uh, uh, there was a tendency of farmers to actually apply fresh manure to the to the spawns because there was uh, there were otherwise no use of the um, of the manure um, because um, aquaculture is um, is the most dominated uh, activity in that region. But um, so there is certainly um, I think uh, technology like this can um, help. Uh, process some of that fertilizers and then um, uh, utilization of that energy into the household system is great. Um, but um, it's it's true that the the, the cost of biodigesters um, as they are now are um, is certainly is a challenge. But realizing that we also see that you know in, in many countries like. Um, you know, in Bangladesh and in India and elsewhere, uh, these type of technologies are also promoted under a particular, um, you know, policies um, where um, certain amount of subsidies are offered to the actors. So you can also look at those models, which are often like a great way of, um, you know, engaging um, policymakers into uh, expanding this type of technology when we know that you know the, the cost for some time um, won't be uh, reduced by much. So uh, these were some of the, um, I think, um, um, examples that um, you know, many can use to drive more financing into you know, this type of climate smart activity. And with uh, you know, more sort of interest from the uh, energy companies, um, um, I think there there are more um, probably interest um, coming on the ground to take them to scale, which probably would have another opportunity to reduce that cost. Thank you for that. So this next question or group of questions is for Judy and Noral. Um, so Alex Ruzovic and several others asked about um, women in and decision making in livestock management. Um, if how the different projects addressed women's decision making over livestock production, um, if there was any opposition from men to uh, women making more decisions 
in the sector um, and if the project helped increase women's decision-making power. So yeah, this is um, one issue that is always very, very interesting. Uh, what we have observed um, over time, so first of all, uh, what we have observed is men own the cattle most of the time, women do the work, the production work, and, and also women, uh, we have seen that in most cases women also own the milk for food. When the milk starts to become income generating and it's a lot, then men are interested. Um, I think empowering women um, as well as men to understand the sector and the benefits um, in the dairy space just has enabled them be also an information hub so that when the men have seen that they, they understand because the women will be more available to come for you know meetings for training um, and stuff like that, they will be the natural staying back home with the with their cows. So um, has enabled the men, you know, trust them more, you know, with the activity. When the money starts to be a lot, then the men are interested. But when, but, but for this one and two cows, it's um, what we have observed is that the women are selling the milk, the ones that are participating in the activity, they sell the milk and just use the money for, you know, uh, household um, uh, issues and, and other related issues. Over time also we have seen increased joint decision making between the man and, 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 and their wife on how to invest in, pro, in, in both in production and, and, in, and with the money that is coming from after sale of the, of the produce. Yeah, so we've seen, we're seeing less and less of the, of the fight not in all cases this is like looks like the general trend now and information has been key i think that um emma i think the the some of the decision making uh, data that we have shared are um on a daily sort of uh, management aspects of the farm. So I, I think what's important as we look into the um, uh, decision-making um, sort of index is to, is to really see that, um, um, you know, how many different type of decisions are made, um, you know, um, across the, the farming uh, responsibilities, um, starting from, you know, buying an animal or selling an animal, buying a milk, or doing daily sort of, you know, other sort of management aspects. So, um, and they, that really varies in, in, in terms of the context, like how the roles uh, kind of um, distributions are between the different members of the family. Um, so oftentimes what we see that, you know, men does do outside work and and because the smallholder dairy is a women's um responsibility in terms of management um they are more um um available in terms of receiving a particular service such as a vaccine or or a deworming services either this is provided by a public agency or the services are purchased um but when it comes to i think Selling an animal, I think the, the decision making pattern certainly differs. Um, and even though we have seen uh, more on the joint decision making aspects when it comes to critical decisions like buying an animal where, you know, more money is involved or selling an animal. Uh, so we see more joint decision making than uh, decision those are solely made by women. Great, thanks for those answers. Um, so this next cluster of questions is for Umias. Um So Harinder Markar asks, um, and others ask about the accessibility of feed additives for um, producers in low and middle income countries, both economically and uh, logistically. 
Uh, yeah, so I think for the, the feed additives um, at present are not even available in um, in any countries. I mean, uh, there's only one that's been approved in Europe uh, so far, uh, Europe and, and uh, South, South America countries, um, and it's not yet in, in production to, to, to be able to be used um, in, in those countries as well. Uh, so this is um, more a kind of a, a developing thing that's that, that's happening now. Um, and there are also some feed additives that have been developed now that would improve the productivity as well. Um, it makes sense because as you reduce methane, methane is, is, is uh, energy, and, and so you're saving some energy for the for the animals as well. And that can go into uh, more milk production or, or, or better growth as well. So um, there are some potential feed additives that are under development at the moment that would not be very uh, expensive to to produce. And and so if we if we can have those uh, feed additives that are not expensive and we can put it in uh, in the in the diet and and actually be able to increase the productivity, so that may offset the cost of those. Uh, uh, additives as well, as well. Hopefully, it will be more than covering the cost of those uh, feed additives. And also, the the other thing is that um, uh, the carbon market is being developed at the moment. Um, and so, if farmers are being paid um, to to reduce emissions, so that they basically they can sell the carbon that they are reducing onto the uh, to an open market or or some sort of uh, a carbon market, then that would make it much more attractive for, for farmers to be able to incorporate this as well. And the other thing is uh, a lot of retailers are uh, encouraging farmers to, to, to adopt those uh, uh, measures that would reduce uh, emissions or improve sustainability, and, and so that uh, those retailers may sell those things at a premium as well. So there are different ways in which uh, farmers are able to capitalize on these new technologies, but at the moment, it is mostly uh, uh, under research. It's not widely deployed, you know, it needs to be approved by uh, different agencies. Um, but I see that uh, because of the, so much interest in the climate change and there's so much um, uh, potential and, and funding availability now to work on these areas, um, I see that in the next maybe three to five years, some of those will make it to the market and, and become successful, and we will be able to see it in, in markets in um, low- and middle-income countries as well. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, so this next question is for everyone. Um, Marjan Lenneman asks, uh, with climate change, smallholder livestock farmers and pastoralists must prioritize adaptation and resilience in their livelihood risk strategies. How should they or would they combine this with greenhouse gas emission mitigation for a climate smart livestock development strategy? You know, that was a rather juicy question, um, but anyone can jump in and attempt to answer it. Um, I don't know that I can conclusively um, or give give uh, a conclusive answer, but I think we, we have, we have, we are starting to see evidence that integrating uh, good animal the livestock um, and dairy nutrition practices is actually contributing to to uh, greenhouse gases emission, reduce greenhouse gases emission. And so I think taking some of that, you know, evidence into practice um, would actually be one first step, at least if, if I was going to to do more interventions in in dairy. Uh, for the next one or two years, I think that's one of those things I would really, you know, promote. Um, and hopefully we can see even a uh, better impact um, in that area while farmers are also making more, more money from the milk that they're producing.
Emma, am I there? Uh, Judy, Hi. we can hear yes. you. Yeah, does someone else want to take a crack at this question? Emma, I, I wanted to say that, you know, uh, many of the, uh, you know, emissions-related uh, conversations are um, still unpacking. Um, so, for us, I think we are more interested to understand the emission patterns here in the livestock industry, um, looking for more collaborations among the other partners. But one thing is uh, very sure that we are, we are um, hearing a lot of interest um, from different agencies, academias, private sectors, um, and regulators as well. And, and I, see, I see that there's some clear sort of um, goals um, for this year is to better understand the, the emission patterns um, looking into many of these, um, I think, technologies, uh, let's say those are already tested and, and validated in the developing country context or developed country context. So there's a lot of interest from the private sectors um, in, in you know, knowing more of that. So it's, uh, it's also, you know, for us, is more into understanding and engaging the partners more. Great, thank you. So the next question is from Verita Hansen. Um, and this is for MES, but um, anyone can answer if they would like to. So are any of the projects represented on the panel using um, this or other ration software or apps? And what has the experience been with using that technology? Um, and what farmer or farm profile or size has had the most uptake? Right, so um, for, for us, uh, we, we are developing those uh, Russian formation softwares. Um, so the, the, the reason was that when we went to um, Vietnam, um, that was maybe uh, eight, nine years ago, and 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 we ask what what they needed, and we went we, we talked with the Minister of Agriculture, and then we we, we went and, and talked with uh, with farmers and extension agents. One of the things that they were saying was uh, they really need uh, a Russian form of software written in Vietnamese that you, that uses local ingredients as well. So they have they had access to Russian formulation, but but it is in English, and also it didn't have the ingredients local ingredients that they needed to to include in those formulations. So that's when we kind of set uh, set to uh, develop those uh, Russian formation um, uh, software in in Vietnamese, and it was done for beef cattle and for dairy cattle. Uh, and um, the, the 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 uptake was uh, so the, the ministry then distributed this through the the extension services as well as uh, the the universities that are the training um, students as well. Uh, right now, it's part of the curriculum for the universities to. It gives them an aid for teaching animal nutrition, as well as once the students are, uh, are ready to, to to go into the workforce, uh, then they 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 have this ability to use it as well. At the same time, the commercial f farming community within Vietnam also got trained on this uh, Russian formulation software, so they have been using this, um, uh, and there has been um, periodical um, training sessions that has been organized by. The Minister of Agriculture in Vietnam, uh, where a number of uh, uh, extension agents and farmers are trained on this uh, on this software, and so the feedback that we that we've uh, that we've gotten over the years was that um, uh, there is more and more access of smartphones in rural communities in in Vietnam and and elsewhere, and so uh, we were encouraged to to uh, develop a mobile app so that people would would be able to. Um, do this without having to have a computer or, or even the internet. Once you have you download the app, then uh, you don't need the internet to run it. 
so that's where things are moving uh, at the moment. Uh, we've done through USAID uh, projects, uh, similar things in Ethiopia for dairy cattle and in Burkina Faso for uh, um, sheep and, and goats and for Niger also say, for sheep and goats. Uh, right now, doing similar things for Cambodia and uh, Laos. Uh, and these are, again, they are in, in, in the uh, languages. So in Cambodia will be in Khmer, in Laos will be in Lao, in Ethiopia was in Amharic. Um, so uh, making sure that the people who, who understand those languages will, will use them instead of relying on uh, English-based um, kind of Russian formulation. And also, you know, it's targeted to the, ta to the type of animal that they are using. Uh, again, also to the targeted to the type of uh, feed. Uh, working with, uh, with ILRI, for example, we've, uh, we've gotten a lot of um, data on um, ingredients in Ethiopia, which was included in the, into the software. And so if you are using the dairy uh, formulation software in Ethiopia, you have choices of ingredients uh, from different regions of, uh, of Ethiopia. Uh, and different seasons as well, so that you use you, you choose the most appropriate ingredient for feed formulation. Uh, so that's what's been happening. There's a lot of uptake in Vietnam. The others we just finished them up now, so we, uh, we don't know yet what the uptake is going to be. But um, this will be measured as as we uh, as it's launched. So uh, maybe Emma, I can just add there is a tool uh, developed also by um, by Elri, um, and that is the GFIST. Um, and my colleagues from Elri are expounding on it um, on the wall. We have introduced it to to a number of um, the dairy cooperatives that we work with, um, and and that is more uh, designed to inform appropriate uh, feed solutions that farmers can find at local levels. Um, so slightly different uh, from what um, my colleague presenter is talking about. And yet it's very helpful to the farmers. Great, thank you. So um, looking at the time, I think that will be our last question. Um, do any of the panelists want to offer any final thoughts? I think I, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity and also thank you for the other panelists, uh, which is very insightful for me and uh, learn a lot from, from the other panelists as well. But I think it's, it's clear that we will continue to, 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 to work together and, and learn from experiences in, in, in the U.S. And, and the target countries as well. So um, yeah, I think we need to, to keep going. I'd also want to thank um, uh, lots of us for listening and all of us for listening and many of us for engaging us on the on the chat. Uh, lots of interesting and mind um, jogging um, questions. And I know that one of us has asked about the disaggregation of the data that are provided, um, uh, further disaggregation. So, uh, Emma, um, through your guidance, uh, you can help me know how I can, you know, uh, pass on that information so that um, other people can also get it. Yeah, just echoing um, with the others, thank you um, for pulling this uh, webinar. And I, I saw in the chat box there's, you know, many important and interesting questions. So um, I think we'd be um, interested in, in going through that, you know, list of questions. Um, and I think it will also, um, you know, kind of prompt a lot of um, interest from our team as well. Uh, but thanks to USAID. I think it's uh, um, what I wanted to say is that um, there's a lot of um, other coordinating aspects that we can also think about um, as, you know, we, we asked about this, um, you know, uh, issues of continued, um, you know, well-being of uh, human animals and the ecosystem. So I think a lot of other 
um, coordination aspects we can actually work on. For example, the um, you know the health and population portfolio and the the economy growth portfolio. I think there's there's a lot to really exchange and and make our efforts more more coordinated. But thank you um, for this opportunity. Great. Yeah, thanks. So another big thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Ramias Kibrab, Udi Odongo, Nurul Siddiqui, and Nelson Owanji, despite having those technical difficulties. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge um, that folks are joining from a lot of different time zones, some early in the morning, some late at, in the evening. So um, big thank you. Uh, also, thank you to our livestock champions at USCID, um, Terrell Kahan, Mira Chandra, Andrew Bisson, uh, Peter Bowman, and Farzana Ramzan, uh, who's our gender champion, um, who are instrumental in putting this webinar together and supporting myself as the moderator. And another big thank you to Michael Saltz, Morgan Brown, Shantice McCorkle, and everyone else at KDLT for their technical support. Um, so, as we mentioned earlier, um, we do have that uh, Google form that you can put any additional questions. We did also save all the questions um, from the chat and the Q&A, um, and we will attempt to answer as many as we can in a future AgriLinks post. Um, and please continue to look out for blog posts on AgriLinks related to livestock, climate, and gender throughout the rest of this month. Right. Thank you, and have a great day.